Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, to the McKinney chapter of the SAR October meeting. Please uh, rise and all of you give us our invitation. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, giver of all life, we entrust the United States of America to, the, to thy loving care. Thou art the rock on which this nation was founded. Thou alone art the true source of our cherished rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let thy glory be seen in this land, and let thy glory dwell among the people of this land. Send thy spirit to guide the hearts of our nation's leaders. Open their minds to the great work of human life and the responsibilities that accompany human freedom. Remind thy people that true happiness is rooted in seeking and doing thy will. All this we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge of the United States flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The pledge to the te Texas flag, Peter Ford. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. And the SAR pledge be led by Walter Reedy. Of course. We, we citizens, the leaders of the American Revolution, who by your sacrifices established the United States of America, reaffirm our faith in the principles of liberty and our constitutional republic, and solemnly pledge ourselves to defend them against every foe. And Tom Nelson will lead us in the mission statement. The sons of the American Revolution honors our revolutionary war with patriot ancestors by promoting patriotism, serving our communities, educating, inspiring future generations about the founding principles of our country. Please be seated. And at this time, we'll have self introductions. <laughs> well, I'm Colin Nelson from the McKinney chapter, and then my wife Carol here with me. But I've got an school member of the McKinney chapter. Mark Harrison, Dallas chapter, the McKinney chapter. Sound that for us in Dallas chapter. Peter Ford, McKinney chapter. Paul Andreessen, McKinney chapter. Pete um, McClellan, McKinney. Nathan Wyatt, Wyatt Wanda, from McKinney chapter. John Maloney, Dallas. Archman, Dallas. Foster Navy Secretary, and online we have Bob Milwee. Hey, everybody. Hi, Dr. Bob. Bob said hi. Uh, and Mark McCraw, McKinney Chapter. At this time, uh, Tom Milson, our VP of Programs, will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> okay. So tonight we're honored to have uh, Dr. John Maloney here with us. Uh, John was born and raised in the great state of Massachusetts and received his undergraduate degree, uh, BS in biology from Springfield College, the home of basketball in Springfield, Mass. All right. Following his undergraduate education, he pursued interest in medical entomology. Entomology. I've already told him I made wish for some of the words that correct me. Entomology, 
are earning a master's in public health from Yale University. Subsequently, he received his MD degree from Georgetown University. John completed the Internal Medicine Residency and Infectious Disease Fellowship Programs at Emory University in Alabama. He's moved all over the place. Georgia. Oh, Georgia, I'm sorry. What I say? Oh, in Atlanta. I got I get Alabama out of it. Okay. Uh, he served for two years in the United States Public uh, Health Service at the Centers for Disease Control as an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. We need a word or two on that before you leave. Okay. I didn't realize there was one of those. Uh, John was an assistant professor uh, in uh, medicine at Emory School of Medicine for four years before he entered private practice in Atlanta. He is uh, board certified in internal medicine as well as infectious diseases. While studying at Yale, John was involved in the early research on Lyme disease, which are, uh, originated in Lyme, Lyme Connecticut, uh, a stone's throw from New Haven. Uh, as he progressed in his medical career, John witnessed some of the earliest cases of the AIDS epidemic in 1981 and 82. He remained heavily engaged in uh, combating HIV and AIDS, along with other interests, until his retirement in 2021, after 34 years in the medical practice. Today's presentation will reflect John's lifelong interest in history, as well as his passion for medicine. So without further ado, turn it over to you. You can do whichever you want to say. You can do the same thing. Can you walk around? Let me walk around a bit. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm sure after a wonderful meal of barbecue, you really want to hear about infectious diseases. That's, that's all I know to talk about. So, just to kind of put it into perspective, some statistics from the Revolutionary War. There were approximately 2.5 million people in the country. Total de war death was between 25,000 and 70,000. The estimates are all over the place. It's difficult to know exactly where it was. Roughly equivalent to 3.5 to 10 million people today. Of the people who died in the war, approximately 6,800 were killed in action. And at least 17,000 died from diseases not directly related to combat. Another 8,500 were seriously wounded. Many of them died later, and it's unclear what kind of statistics we had on them. But the bottom line on it is probably four to ten times more soldiers died from diseases than died from combat. These were the most common deadly diseases at the time of war. The top three had asterisks next to them. I'm going to talk about them in a little bit. Then there was typhus, which was also known as camp fever. If it occurred in Valley Forge, it was camp fever. Some of the patriots here had ancestors who died there. If it happened on a ship, it was ship fever. Typhoid, dysentery, influenza killed people, tuberculosis. I want to talk about smallpox and how that affected the Northern Canadian campaign. How malaria and yellow fever kind of add mixed together affected the Southern campaign. And I'm also going to talk about the prison ships. It's, in, it's difficult to have a talk on this without talking about them. And there was no one disease that affected the prison ships. To kind of review this a little bit, at the beginning of the war, the British were taking more prisoners than they had room to, they didn't know where to put them. They got a bunch of old, derelict folks, put them out in the bay, usually in New York, but between 15 and 20 folks in New York Harbor. And they gave people the option. Some of the patriots were given the option of turning traitor, professing, uh, loyalty to the king and probably ending up on a British ship somewhere else in the world. Or they could go to a prison ship. The right, on the right side, you see kind of a stylized rendition of what it was like. 
that probably is actually nicer than it really was. Also have to remember that one of some of the more prominent infectious diseases at this time were gastrointestinal. So you can imagine what this, this thing probably looked and smelled like. Approximately 70% of the people who went on to the prison ships never got off. This is just one rendition of the most notorious one, the HMS Jersey, that was in New York Harbor. At any one time, there may have been a thousand men in the ship. Every morning they opened the gates and they pulled the dead out from underneath down the lower levels. They could be just thrown overboard into the water. If they were lucky, they were hastily buried in mass graves on the shore. An estimated, well, that, that should be a zero, but anyway. <laughs> an estimated 11,000 colonists died on these hulks, primarily from infectious diseases. <clears throat> Wallabout Bay in New York was an unsightly graveyard. There's stories of people trying to walk through the area and with these macabre skeletal arms, legs, heads coming up out of the beach. So nonetheless, not many people went there. It wasn't until 1801 when they started to build the Brooklyn Naval Yard that they cleaned this up. So some of these unfortunates were lying around the beach for close to 20 years. This is the memorial to the prison ship Martyrs, it's in Brooklyn, New York. And the remains of many of the people that they were able to retrieve when they did build the Brooklyn Naval Yard are buried here. These patriots died miserably, died anonymously, and they really should be remembered. Smallpox. This is the first major military initiative of the new Continental Army. It was thought that perhaps Quebec could become the 14th colony. Two armies, Montgomery and Benedict Arnold, that Benedict Arnold, came up, whoops, came up through, I'm sorry. Montgomery came up in Eastern New York. Benedict Arnold came up through the wilds of Maine. They met in Quebec. Unfortunately, both armies were full of smallpox, and the further they traveled, the sicker they got. I have to show you smallpox, just so you can appreciate how horrible it was. Picture on the right is a young child who has a pretty significant case. 30% of people who got smallpox died. On the right, you see a survivor. The good news is he survived, the bad news is he was literally scarred for life. In addition to this, 10% of the survivors went blind because the disease involved their eyes. So you died, you were disfigured, you went blind, all great outcomes. In Canada, understandably, continental soldiers were more afraid of smallpox than they were of the enemy. The idea of dying in the wilds of Canada in the middle of the winter from smallpox was not very appealing. And many of the soldiers said that they were not going to re-enlist after their term was up in December of 1775. This pushed Arnold and Montgomery to some difficult decisions. The longer they were there, the sicker their soldiers got. And they kept got up against the the wall where people were literally going to walk away at the end of their enlistment. So they embarked on an ill-timed, poorly designed attack in Quebec and were soundly defeated. On the other hand, the British were not affected by smallpox as much. Smallpox is an old world disease, so many of them already had it. And the British had started to immunize their soldiers, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So anyway, the campaign was a failure. General Montgomery died from wounds. Benedict Arnold had his leg shattered. Hundreds of soldiers were captured. And as a final twist, the relief general who came to replace Montgomery died of smallpox. 
John Adams sums it up pretty well. The pot is 10 times more terrible than the Britons, Canadians, and Indians together. This was the cause of our retreat. In George Washington, smallpox is more destructive than the soil. Speaking of George, this picture on this portrait on the left, oops, sorry. This portrait on the left shows him the way most of us know him. He's regal and he's very well fed. On the right is a more recent portrait of him. This was done for the, the Freeman, Freemasonry. And this portrait is at the Freemason Lodge in Alexandria, Virginia. This shows a much more subdued, tired man. This was done roughly at the beginning of the second term. He was only about 60. But what was important, and you can't see it so much here, but on the right side of his face and on his nose are smallpox scars. George had had smallpox. So he was well familiar with the disease. He got it when he was in Barbados while they were trying to help his brother. Washington was faced with a very difficult dilemma. People did not want to enlist in the army because they didn't want to go to camp and get smallpox. Now, there was a very crude immunization. And ironically, Continentals learned about this from a slave, a guy by the name of Unsimus. He had seen immunizations done in Africa. It was also being done in Asia. Well, basically, you take a knife and incise pustules from somebody who had smallpox, and then turn around and incise that into somebody else, somebody who had an headache. It worked. The good news was only one to two people died, one, one to two percent died from the variolation, which is the correct term for it. But this was difficult because they got real smallpox. They had to be isolated for four to six weeks. He was also worried that the British would catch hold if they embarked on an immunization process, that the army would be weakened and the British could really have a go of them. So there was a great need for secrecy. He distrusted his advisors. Benjamin Church was his uh, Surgeon General, and he turned out to be a spy for the British. And there was also pressure on him to immunize because they were concerned about biological warfare. There was precedent for this in the uh, French, and, um, French and Indian War. The British had given smallpox inoculated blankets to the Indians, and he was concerned that they were going to try to do that with his soldiers as well. February 6, 1777, a huge decision. Washington decided that against all odds, he was going to have the army inoculated and were variolated against smallpox. It was a huge success. Eventually, four, approximately 40,000 soldiers were regulated. Many fewer than anticipated died. It was less than 1.1%. It actually increased his enrollment. Soldiers were excited to go into the army so they could be immunized. Troops, the British troops, no longer enjoyed their smallpox advantage. And gradually, more regulation of civil, uh, civilians began. It's interesting because Jenner gets credit for the smallpox vaccine a few years later. It was actually Unsimus Slave who got us started in the right direction. The Southern Campaign. This beast, female mosquito, is responsible for more human death and suffering than all the wars, famines, and genocides put together. It's estimated that conservatively, mosquitoes are responsible for approximately five to 10 billion deaths just from malaria alone. Mm -hmm. Malaria causes intermittence. Very briefly, you got bitten by a mosquito that had malaria, the parasite entered your body, and then caused recurring infections. Every two to three days, you would have a recurring infection. People would have teeth rattling chills to the point that they literally shook themselves out of bed. 
They would have fevers at 103 or 104. And then drenching sweats. Well, after that party, they weren't much good for anything. They were wiped out for the next two or three days. Unfortunately, then they got their next episode. Wash, rinse, repeat. This went on for weeks or months at a time. The continental, on the flip side of what happened with smallpox, the continentals, in some cases, had immunity. The soldiers who had grown up in the South had some immunity in wearing. The longer the British stayed in the low country, Georgia, South Carolina, the worse it got. They had to garrison Savannah when they took it over. They had to garrison Charleston when they took that over. And often more than 50% of the soldiers in the garrison were wiped out to malaria. Yellow fever also killed troops. It was indistinguishable from a bad case of malaria. And we don't know how many yellow fever cases were there, but we know it was involved. This was a historian of the Hessians. The Hessians were from Germany and had virtually no experience, no immunity to malaria, so it really wiped them out. Carolina was a spring in, it was the spring of paradise, in the summer of hell, and autumn of hospital. This shows crudely that as the war went on, that more battles were fought in the South. I mentioned that the British took over Savannah, they put a garrison there, they took over Charleston, they had to put a garrison there. And then, subsequently, they moved inland. Cornwallis was desperately trying to get away from the malaria. It seemed as though everywhere he went, his soldiers got sick. What they couldn't have known, because they didn't know how malaria worked for another hundred years, was that his army was a cauldron of malaria. The soldiers were full of it. So wherever they went, the local mosquitoes picked it up and perpetuated the cycle. After the battle at Guilford Courthouse, even though that was technically a victory for the British, they needed reinforcements, they needed supplies, he needed to go to a deep harbor port. He didn't want to go to Savannah or Charleston because he knew that his garrison was being wiped out there. So he decided he thought it would be a good idea to go to Yorktown. What, what could go wrong if Cornwallis went to Yorktown? Well, as it turns out, Yorktown had plenty of mosquitoes too, maybe even more. He needed a deep water port, and these are his own words. The decision to move north, he hoped to preserve the troops from the fatal sickness was so nearly ruined, the army last autumn. Disease, particularly malaria, reduced British fighting capacity more effectively than gave bullets. Cornwallis went to Yorktown, and we know what happened there. When he first arrived in 1781, in August, he had approximately 8,700 troops fit for duty, but three weeks later, only 37% remained fit for duty. Cornwallis, perhaps this was a little bit of uh, sour grapes. They had been forced to give up the post. Troops have been greatly weakened by sickness. Our numbers have diminished by enemy fire, but particularly by sickness. Our force diminished daily by sickness. Yorktown and mosquitoes ended British hope and decided in the American War. And remembering that the mosquito that feeds on people is a female mosquito, the males don't suck blood. But the mosquito the footwork can be the founding mothers of the United States. <laughs> My conclusions. Smallpox immunity greatly benefited the British until Washington mandated troop perilation. Smallpox likely contributed to the failure of the Canadian campaign. Quebec may have been the 14th colony had the army been successful. Malaria aided the Continental Army and influenced Cornwallis' defeat in Yorktown. And Cornwallis will blame his defeat more on sickness than his enemies.
I gotta tell you one more thing. This is, we just advanced 200 years, 200 plus years. And one of the most remarkable achievements in public health history, smallpox was eradicated in 1980. The last case of smallpox occurred in 1978. It was actually a lab case. So a lab worker died in the lab and this was not a natural infection. At this point, people decided that we needed to consolidate it. We just couldn't have smallpox out there. It was consolidated to two labs, CDC and Russia. This was a voluntary process in any rogue country, any terrorist group who happened to have samples of smallpox were not obliged to turn it over. So it's entirely possible there are stores of smallpox out there that we don't know about. Case in point, in July of 2014, NIH found six vials of smallpox in one of their freezers. Now, they thought they had turned everything over and everything was at CDC, but there was more there. And so who knows what other may have been in other places. Smallpox is in the highest category of potential biological warfare. There are six groups of diseases that are felt to be high risk for biological warfare and smallpox is right in the middle of them. In 1992, a high-level Russian defector, a guy by the name of Ken Almabak, confirmed that the Russians, or the Soviets, had weaponized the virus. They had tons of liquid smallpox ready to go. We think they destroyed all the stores. Then, in 2019, there was an explosion at the vector lab in Russia. The Russians claimed that there was no biohazard material involved, but some conspiratory theorists think that perhaps this was an effort by terrorist groups to get, get a hold of smallpox. That's all I have. So the, uh, the distribution process for the uh, inoculate, inoculation during the war was that just a, a centralized area where they just spread out, doctors were just spread out through the column. Like, it was mostly oh, centralized in Morristown in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, okay. Wow. That's just where the concentration of the, yeah. of the troops were. They figured that was the most efficient way to do it. Okay. Where, where did the, the, the uh, Patriots obtain the, the immunization medicine? Did they get it from the English or? They got it from some of their own soldiers who had smallpox. Uh -huh. They pre preferably took samples who had, from somebody who had a mild case, hoping that transmitting mild cases would be better. Hey, one more question here. So uh, the people who had already had it, like Washington, would, would he have been required to probably get it again? No. Once you get smallpox, you, you should be immune for life. Okay. Now there's concerns now. We stopped immunizing in 1972. Many of the people here in this room have scars in their arms right. where they got smallpox. <laughs> if you were born after 1972, you didn't get immunized. But there's concern that if you got immunized that long ago, and you got exposed to smallpox at this point, could you conceivably get sick? The answer is nobody knows. Nobody wants to. And John, the science behind the immunization, if the small amount of them creates antibodies within the body. Yes. And they, you know, initially the first immunization efforts were with real smallpox. And then Jenner brought along cowpox, which was much milder. The origin of smallpox. Where? <laughs> what? What called it? <laughs> Some place in antiquity, like. But it was an old world disease. It was not the. We brought it. In. We brought it over here. The smallpox decimated the Indian populations. Eighty to ninety percent of the Indians who got exposed to it died. I mean, they talk about the plague, and there was they can trick. They can apparently attribute uh, that to rats or. Well, that, that's what, 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 that's
live on rats, and the rats came here and the bees got off. The smallpox is a different. Smallpox is human to human. There's no, there's no animal reservoir. We have plague in the United States, like in New Mexico. It lives in the rodent population. It's endemic. Hmm. And, and it is contagious, right? You bet. Do you have to touch it or to be exposed to it? Or? Smallpox, you play it. Smallpox. Smallpox, it's often respiratory, and it can also be contact. Okay. Very infectious. Well, would you touch COVID? <laughs> is it as a subject to talk about? I can try a little bit. <laughs> I mean, in our time, of course, as you pointed out, smallpox is pretty mm -hmm. much had history, but COVID was something we've all lived through here in the last couple of years. Yep. What, uh, what's your view on COVID origins and the process for getting through the getting through what we got through. Well, there's clearly controversy about where it came from. Mm -hmm. There's a school that thinks that this was created in a laboratory in China. The more generally accepted idea at this point is that it came from China, but it came from that wet market. There were some, they were able to go back and find traces of the original COVID in that. So it originated in China and through lack of attention or whatever, it had the opportunity to go other places. While well, you were addressing the malaria situation, I looked up at malaria in Wikipedia and it says that in 2022, 608,000 people died of malaria worldwide. Still dying from it. A child under the age of five dies in Sub Saharan Africa every five minutes, 24 7. It's amazing. Wow. So, not only was it a horrible disease in the past, but it's still killing, still killing people. And how is the protection done for that disease? Well, it's transmitted by mosquito. Oh, killing the mosquitoes. Killing the mosquitoes. Oh. Other than that, there's no. They have some vaccines that have been tried, by and large, and they failed miserably. But there's a couple now that may be a little better. Like if we travel to the tropics, I thought I remember something about uh, suggesting a certain vaccine. There's no vaccine, but there is a prevention. For example, in the Vietnam War, our troops took malaria prevention. They took pills, pills to, to prevent it. Some of the pills can be taken once a week. Some have to be taken every day. But the best way to avoid it is just don't get bitten by a mosquito. Uh, <laughs> easier said than done. <laughs> and now we have our own mosquito-borne stuff. We got West Nile here. Anthony Fauci got West Nile. I don't know if you heard about that. Really? Anthony Fauci got West Nile virus from mosquito in his backyard. Wow. <laughs> One disease that you didn't mention was uh, polio. Yeah. Was, was that present back then? It was present. It didn't make the top the top list, but it was there. It was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Very, very interesting. As you can tell by, the, I think this probably had people ask more questions on this one than we've had in a long time. And so, uh, very interesting. Uh, we'd like to present you with this certificate of appreciation. Uh, again, for coming and providing this wonderful program to us. So, uh, again, thank you so much. We'll turn around this way. I'm going to put this mic and I'll hold it here. All right. Let's go from the lag out of the lag. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
minutes. So, so it's sort of interesting. I remember the other day I was as I was driving home, there was a sign saying uh, we're going to spring for to meet the mosquitoes between ten o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning. So, uh, so we've been getting sprayed here lately. Are you going to get that? Oh. <laughs> 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 just to look at. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. <laughs> what a, what a, wow. Okay, let's see here. Let me get this other one up here, right? <laughs> That's good, Wanda. <laughs> oh, those days. Okay. If we're to use the no, or y'all think you, you want to introduce it. I don't remember how we did that. I think before you have to Judge White. Yep, yes, man. Judge White and Paul. Paul and Grace. I'll I'll go with the uh, right before the yes, sir. Yeah, you'll be actually <clears throat> three, 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 three. not many of us, of course. Not many of us. Yeah, I was. We'll live to be a hundred years old. Um, one of our compatriots in our chapter did live to be a hundred years old. In fact, he lived to be a hundred and two years old. Eugene Earl Trimble. Uh, and I want to read a little bit about it. he had a very interesting life. And uh, I only met him in person, I guess, on one occasion. Talked to him over the telephone several times, usually on or about his birthday. And uh, it was always a very interesting, upbeat, positive conversation with Gene. Eugene Earl Trimble of McKinney, Texas, passed away peacefully at his home on Sunday, September 22nd, at the age of 102. He was born on April 28th, 20. 1922 in the Davis House, a log house on his family's farm near Joy, Kentucky. He grew up and worked on his family's farm until the age of 13. When the family moved to Smithland, Kentucky, the county seat of Livingston County, there he went to Smithland <laughs> Elementary School and Livingston County High School. After high school, Eugene worked in Paducah, Kentucky and attended Drones College of Business. In 1942, Eugene went to Washington, D.C., worked for the FBI, and to attend the George Washington University until he joined the U.S. Army in World War II. During the war, Eugene was an Army Combat Engineer in the 94th Infantry Division under General George S. Patton and served in France, Belgium, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. Eugene returned to Washington, D.C. after the war, finished his undergraduate degree at the George Washington University, became a certified public accountant, and married Betty Sue Owen of Alonia, Arkansas in 1950. They had two children, Gary Allen and Janet Lynn, and lived in Garrett Park Estate in Kensington, Maryland, from 1950 to 1996, Eugene worked at the W.D. Campbell Company, Executive Office Furniture Company in Washington, D.C. He began his career as the company's accountant and retired as the CEO and owner of the company in 1996. In 1999, Eugene and Betty moved to retire to McKinney, Texas in the Dallas area to be near their six grandchildren. <laughs> Eugene and Betty participated in their church and in community affairs, and they were active members of the Sons of the American Revolution and the Daughters of the American Revolution, respectively. Betty passed in, in 2019, and Eugene continued to live in their home until his passing. Eugene had a large 100th birthday celebration in April 2022, complete with the City of McKinney Proclamation of April 28th, 2022, as Eugene Tremble Day, presented to him by the mayor of McKinney, 
and a veteran of foreign wars were ready for him in front of his home. Eugene was preceded by his parents, Foster Oliver Trimble and Laura Allen, Ellen Schaus Trimble, and his brother, Glenn Allen Trimble, and his sister, Lou Ellen Trimble Preston. He is survived by his son, Gary Allen Trimble, and wife, Ricardo Marqueda. His daughter, Janet Lynn Trimble Long, husband, Lewis, six grandchildren. Eugene was devoted and a lifelong genealogist and decades member, long member of the National Genealogical Society. He authored many books on the family histories over the years, <clears throat> over the decades. Eugene was also a dedicated and longtime supporter of the Livingston County Historical and Genealogical Society in Smithville Land, Kentucky. <clears throat> Funeral heart services were held September the 29th, that's in a month ago, in the chapel of Boyd Funeral Directors and Cremation Services in Salem, Kentucky. Burial, burial followed at Bethel Cemetery in Joy, Kentucky. We all can aspire to live as full a life as Gene Trimble did. This is a copy uh, that Tom has come brought the light of his original application for membership back in almost 60, almost 70 years ago. Uh, Gene was a good guy. I want to say one thing too here. Thank you. Um, so I had the great honor of meeting Gene um, and uh, the way I got the meeting was when he turned 100 years old, basically, you don't have to pay any more dues to the SAR. <laughs> you, you get both your, uh, basically, both of your memberships covered once you become 100 years old. <laughs> so uh, when I realized that, I went on the website and by on the form we had to fill out and all that. I got it all filled out and needed his signature. And so I called up and, you know, this nice gentleman answered, you know, and I said, well, I told him who I was. I said, I'd like to come over right quick. I wanted to let you know that uh, basically uh, you weren't going to have to pay your dues anymore. Now, he was still paying his dues in, okay, when he was 100 years old, turned 100. He'd been paying all these years, okay? And so he made some comment about well, that's nice because I've been paying them for a long time. <laughs> and I wasn't too sure how to take that, but I thought, I said, well, is it all right? Would be all right if I come over about two o'clock this afternoon and, and I just need your signature right quick and we'll get it where you won't have to pay those dues anymore. And he said, well, that'd be fine. Come on over. So, you know, when somebody reaches 100, you don't sometimes don't know what you're going to walk into, you know, what sort of situation they're in or, or, or you know, just what you're going to walk into so you know so i was a little bit wondered about that and i figured well i'll go in you know congratulate him chat for a few moments get the signature from him if they can still write you know that's where my head was going of course and then we'll then i will uh i uh, will you know shake his hand and i'll leave you know so i ring the door go in there and ring the doorbell this nice looking guy comes up opens the door he didn't look like he was 100 to me i mean he he was quite chipper, and he uh, he said, "Well, come on in. Let's talk for a little while." So we went in to talk, and I, I said, "Well, I'm, I'm excited to give this to you, and you know, we'll sign that." And he said, "Well, I'll sign it after a while. Let's talk for a little while." <laughs> then he started talk. We started talking about the SAR and how he got in and his career and everything. And again, I was thinking, "Well, I'm going to be here five, ten minutes most, and I'll be out of here." Yes. An hour and a half later. <laughs> I really, a very pleasurable hour and a half later, I end up finally saying, well, Gene, I guess, uh, you know, I uh, probably uh, need to go now. And he said, well, okay, if you really feel like that, here, I'll sign this form now. I mean, he was, he was mentally very alert. He was happy to be alive. He had some medical issues that he had he had that kept him from coming to our meetings, but he was a lifelong uh, member. And he was very proud of this. Anyway, so when I, I went and 
after we went through a little bit, we found this, and I thought this was very interesting because if you looked at that, you know, basically joined the SCR in 1956. All those years. So it's like, oh my goodness. Well, anyway, I didn't mean to get up here too much, but I just thought it was very interesting. And then, of course, the other thing was, it was, it was his, uh, basically his family name all the way up to the top. Joseph Trimble was who his family was. So anyway, I couldn't resist putting that up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Oh, I'll go with the, I'll say my part right before the final one. Okay, okay, we'll do that. That's fine. Okay, we'll then back over to you, Mark. Thank you. All right. Any uh from the floor, any announcements from the floor or old business from the floor? Yes, sir. We can start voting on Monday. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. For our new chapter, chapter officers. Uh, yeah. Chapter officers will be soon. Yeah, but, but yeah. <laughs> uh, old business. Uh, we had a pretty good turnout at the DAR meeting on Saturday. I think there were six or eight of us there. Um, and unfortunately, Judge White missed the photo. Uh, but any, but we had a great turnout there. This coming Saturday, there is another event with the DAR where they are doing a great marking for Nancy Barbie Mays at God Grove Cemetery. That's at eleven o'clock uh, this Saturday, October the nineteenth. Um, on the back of the program shows the other upcoming events. The Board of Managers meeting is November the first through the third. And the Color Guard National event is November the 9th, and that's in, in Plano at Oak Point Park. And that's uh, 2801 East Spring Parkway. And Bill Watts will have more details uh, if you're able to go to that. Um, November 16th is Color Guard Veterans Day event, and that's at the Red Tail Pavilion at Oak, Oak Point Park in Plano. And again, Contact Bill Watts for that. And our Christmas party is December the 5th. Um, that's here in McKinney at the Herd Craig Center. And that's next to the Herd Craig House. It's their old carriage house on West Hunt. It's uh, down near the uh, Methodist Church in downtown McKinney. Let's see. Additionally, uh, 2025 is will soon be here. So at our meeting, well, excuse me, not at our meeting, but on November the 1st, uh, we'd like to have our slate of officers, and there's plenty of work to go around, so we'd love to have everybody uh, be involved and apply for any officer position you'd like to apply for. That is all the new business that I'm aware of. Any of anyone else have any additional new business? All right, we'll turn it over to our treasurer, Peter Ford, for our treasurer's report. All right, here's the treasurer's report for tonight's meeting. So at your last meeting, our funds were $884 and a penny. <laughs> uh, this month, our expenses were $45.42 for word frames. And then we spent $65 to reserve our Christmas party venue. Uh, chapters available funds are now $773.59. Uh, at the executive committee, we decided to re let our CD renew for another seven months. We earned $119.14 on September 26. The CD has an available balance of $5,180.09. Unfortunately, the bank has dropped their interest rate to 2.5% uh, from the original four. And I plan to bring this up in the next executive meeting to determine what we're going to do um, with that decision or that change. That's the report. Any questions? Mm -hmm. All good? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Our uh, September minutes were posted to the website. Um, hopefully, everybody's had an opportunity to review those. And concerning the minutes, any uh, discussions? If not, he motions. So I'd ask motion to, yes, sir, Peter. Move to accept the minutes as stated. Any seconds? 
I'll second. Great. Tom Nelson second. Any opposed? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Hmm. All right. Any other business announcements from, from the floor? I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Almighty God, we commend the soul of our dear brother and patriot departed, Eugene Earl Trimble, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection unto eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at whose coming in glorious majesty to judge the world, the earth and the sea shall give up their dead, and the corruptible bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed, and made like unto his own glorious body, according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Remember thy servant Eugene, O Lord, according to thine abundant favor which thou hast bestowed upon thy people. Grant that increasing in knowledge and love of thee, he may go from strength to strength and glory to glory in thy heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. To God's gracious mercy and protection, we commit each of you. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forever. Amen. 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 Please join me now in the recessional. This will be me again. Let uh, us remember our obligations to our forefathers who gave us our constitution to build our lives and independence to the great power and a nation and a free man. We are adjourned. Thank you.